Okay, I think it's time, so let's get started. Um, first item for today, if you would like to follow my slides on your device, laptop, laptop uh, mobile device, whatever, you could just visit that link or scan the QR code for lazy folks out there. So those are hosted on GitHub. So I'll give you another 10 seconds, more or less. Um, if not, you can always visit them later. Five, four, three, two, one. Seems like everyone is set. Okay. Topic for today is Ceph, and today I would like to give you, to give you an update on, uh, in particular, what's new in Ceph, and with new in Ceph I mean with the latest release, which is called Nautilus. Um, my name is Kai, I work for, for SUSE, and if you have any questions, reach out by mail, grab me in the hallway, um, reach out on Twitter, wherever, everything is fine. We have a lot of things we're going to talk about today. Um, first of all, quick introduction into Ceph. Um, just, just that everyone is aware, this is not uh, what is Ceph, what is an object storage talk at all. This is really um, focused on the new features in Ceph. So if you're expecting a, I don't know, a complete bottom line talk about Ceph, that's not what I'm going to talk about, just to say the stage here. Um, nevertheless, that's the only absolute basic picture and slide that I have. Um, I expect everyone has seen that already. Um, please raise your hand if you have seen that picture already and you're aware of what this is all about. A at least ha half of you. So <laughs> I will explain it really quickly. Um, this just shows and visualize the uh, Ceph architecture more or less. Underneath you have the RADOS layer, um, which is a reliable, autonomous, distributed object storage. That's what it stands for. Um, to, to, mm, as easy as it could be un understood, that's where all your data is replicated and the brain of it uh, relies. And um, on top of it, we have right now four different ways how we can access our data, because we would like to store some data in the cluster and we would like to get data out of the cluster. So we have four different ways. Um, to the left here, that's libradars. Um, that's a li library um, you could use to put place stuff in Ceph cluster or to get out of it. Um, you can use, I don't know, almost any language like C, C++, Python. Um, so choose your poison, I would say. Um, second thing is the Rados gateway, um, which is a a uh, REST gateway, which works similar to S3 and Swift. So for those of you who are familiar with AWS um, and S3 there, um, that's more or less how it works. Um, we have RBD, which is a replicated block device. Um, this is used for mainly uh, hyper uh, virtual machines. So that's a block device that could be, could be put underneath a virtual machine. And also RBDs are used, for example, if you put on top an iSCSI gateway to expose this LAN to a third, third node, um, you would use an RBD, which is nothing less than just a block device. Um, and last but not least, I think it's stable since, not quite sure, I think Luminous, um, if I'm not mistaken, um, it's CephFS, that's a POSIX compliant file system, uh, which is put on Ceph. So, um, there's no need to have an NFS gateway, for example, in between, or Samba gateway, um, and on a use, using an RBD, for example, formatting it and then exporting it to clients, you can directly use FFS, which is much more performant and much better. So that's enough for the introduction. Let's get to where we are right now. First, an overview. Luminous was released in 2017, um, then Mimic in May 2018, and we are already post Nautilus. Nautilus was released in March 2019. Um, as you can see already, we're right now on a nine month release cadence, um, and we support a plus minus two upgrade of it. So let's say if you are still on a Luminous release, you can upgrade directly to Nautilus, or if you're already on a Mimic release, you can then jump um, over Nautilus directly to Octopus once it's released. Um, the current uh, cadence, release cadence, is under a heavy debate. Um, I just added a link. Don't get confused. This one is redirecting you to Twitter, um, 
where they started a survey last, uh, last weekend during the Falcon to ask the audience um, if we should may switch back to a 12 month release cadence instead of a nine month release cadence. So um, please make use of it. Um, I would like to switch to a 12 month release cadence again. Um, Seth, just that you're aware, have some, or I would call principles, you can also call them themes in the meanwhile, uh, five of them. First of all, um, usability. Seth, as you're aware, hopefully, uh, or if you tried it already, um, you found it out yourself, it's rather complex to set up and also to ad administer and to manage. Um, so one way to make it easier to consume, for example, with this orchestrator API I'm going to talk later, um, and also to uh, develop some upgrade automation around it. Quality is the next big topic here. Um, quality means um, we're trying to collect crash reports, we have some telemetry module in the meanwhile in, uh, in place, um, together with better documentation and test suite. Performance, obviously everyone wants more performance. Um, to be honest, it's rather easy to get more I.O. out of a Ceph cluster, just add more hardware to it. That's how it works. So if you need more I.O., just add more hardware. It's as easy as it is. Um, the problem is, or the idea behind this, um, back in the days when the storage, the OSD layer was developed, um, it was developed against spinner disks because this was the thing back in the days. In the meanwhile, everyone is talking about all flash, obviously, because it's getting cheaper and cheaper every nowadays. And there is a new project which is called Crimson, um, which refactors the OSD stack more or less completely um, to base or to, to keep that in mind already, and which delivers already better performance compared to the, the old implementation. I saw some uh, presentation back last weekend at the Falcon. There's a Crimson talk, so if you're interested in that, just check it out. Um, Multi-site, which is mainly about S3 management capabilities, so um, all including tiering across different pools, for example. Um, that's what multi-site is about. And last but not least, um, what Torsten already talked about briefly, uh, containers. So underneath the ecosystem, um, this is just a word for Kubernetes, uh, Rook, and um, the whole integration here. Let's get directly into the features. The most noticeable uh, feature change in Nautilus uh, was the, in quotes, newly added dashboard. Um, the first version of the dashboard was added in, was Luminous already, but it was a read-only version. Um, in the meanwhile, this was heavily improved with management capabilities and whatnot. Um, this is how it looks like in the meanwhile. For those of you who have seen maybe the Luminous version already, looks a little bit different. And because I thought, I don't know, just um, boring pictures, uh, let's see. Okay, now it's working. I prepared a quick, just one minute uh, presentation. That's the dashboard. Um, I won't show you everything, but just that you have a clear idea. You have some top menu items. This is, for example, how the OST tab looks like. Um, you get an overview of the OSDs with some details underneath. Um, we have some fancy overlay. If you go over those little, little dots there, um, we can set cluster wide OSD flex, for example, um, like no in. Um, so there's no need to go back to the CLI and console anymore. Um, I want to show you also the RBD tab um, where we can create, delete, edit um, RBDs, uh, also create snapshots um, of it. Um, there is already an existing snapshot, um, which you may see. And last but not least, the pool tab. So as I said, just a quick rough overview. And one thing that has noticeably changed, for example, is the Grafana integration underneath. So that's integrated in all the various uh, tabs and views in the dashboard. But I thought maybe some, I don't know, moving pictures are more interesting than just some static uh, images. As I said already, um, the dashboard heavily evolved. It's now built in into Ceph, so as soon as you just install the Ceph package itself and you set up a cluster, um, it's already there. The only thing you have to do is you have to enable the dashboard module, it's a manager module, and then it's up and running. That's, that's um, everything that's, that's needed. Um, 
it has, as you've already seen, a lot of more management functionality. We'll talk about them in a bit. Um, metric and reporting. Um, what I used here at the back end to collect the data was Prometheus, and then to visualize it in the, in the dashboard was Grafana. And um, yeah, what the outlook is, the whole hardware deployment, service management, uh, that's work in progress. In further details, new functionality, we now support uh, multiple user and roles. Um, in the past, a lot of uh, folks requested stuff like, we would like to have a read-only user, for example, for our monitoring team or for other purposes. And um, that's what we implemented there. Um, we ship with some default roles, like an administrator, RBD manager, uh, read-only user, for example. And if you grant your user with just those specific um, permissions, then he will only see, for example, those specific tabs or can only edit um, those things. We also integrated um, SAML v2 for SSO, single sign-on. Um, we embedded the auditing log into the uh, dashboard. Um, you have seen already the new landing page. We also, which is quite cool, translated the whole UI into, I don't know, seven or eight languages in the meanwhile, hopefully more to come. So in case if there is a language that you are capable of um, and you would like to contribute, that would be the easiest way. We're using TransEffect, so that's rather easy um, to contribute to the community. And on top of that, we are making use of Swagger, which gives us now a nice uh, and I would say fancy way for our REST API documentation. OSD management, you've seen it already, um, setting all the various flags, for example, in OSDs. We can also set, for example, recovery profiles in the meanwhile in the UI. So um, if you have ongoing recovery in your cluster, for example, you can switch between, I think, low, medium, and high um, performance-wise, so it don't uh, impact your cluster that much. Um, we have a config settings editor. Um, so yeah, seriously. Any config option that can be set on a CLI can also be set in the UI, so still you have to know what you're doing, I know, but that's one step forward. Um, we can manage the pools, we can manage um, erasure-coded pool files. Um, also lately, RBD mirroring configuration was added to the UI, so there's no need to do this on the CLI anymore. You can just um, add your peer, adding your peer in the, in the UI, and then create your RBD mirror on top, which is really nifty. And you've seen the Grafana dashboards right now already, so you have a clue how this is supposed to look like. Um, we still have a crush map for you, like we had already in the old days. Uh, it's still a viewer, nothing else. Just visualize the crush map. There's more to come. Um, NFS management, we can do iSCSI manage, target management, um, which in the meanwhile was replaced, um, at least SUSE side, um, with Ceph iSCSI. In the past uh, releases, we used LRBD. Um, we now switch to Ceph iSCSI. We support um, QoS. Um, we can also manage the modules in the UI and um, Prometheus alerting in the meanwhile. I think, as you can see, there are a lot of stuff went into the UI, a lot of progress that we've made. Um, a lot of the effort was, to be honest, to reach feature parity with the old UI that we had, apart from uh, the Ceph dashboard, which was called OpenEdit. In the meanwhile, we are already ahead, and now I guess we have a yeah, good foundation to, to bound on and to start off, and now there is more to come. Another management change, already talked about it briefly, uh, is you can call it the orchestrator sandwich, it's more or less the orchestrator abstraction. Um, the idea behind is to have a single abstraction layer where, for example, the CLI and a dashboard could talk to. Nevertheless, if underneath the deployment tool is ROC, Ceph Ansible, DeepSea, or SSH, for example, so the commands should always be the same, um, and you could add other orchestrators to it if you would like. Um, that's exactly what we're currently working on, and that's also the foundation for the Ceph uh, CLI, or at least the baseline for a unified Ceph CLI so to say. What it can do in the meanwhile, um, it could fetch your node inventory, um, it could create and uh, destroy some demons, um, it could also blink your device LEDs in case it's configured correctly, but it's, it's there. Um, and on top of that, you have the unified CLI, so you have a self orchestrator command, and then behind you can do things like device, as you can see here, device LS, and then the node, OSD create, and there are many more, so you have a unified UI. 
And I think that's what I talked already in the dashboard uh, section about. Um, the idea is to integrate those service management into, into the UI in the future. So to soon or later move away as much as we can from the CLI to the dashboard. So in case you would like to use it, you can use the dashboard. If you would like to use the CLI, yeah, you're free to use the CLI as well. Um, one of the biggest Rados features that came with Nautilus, I'm not sure how many of you have dealt with uh, the PG num already in the past. Um, in case you've ever deployed a Ceph cluster, I imagine you deal, had to deal with it at least once. Um, there is a way to calculate the best uh, PG num for your current pool that you would like to create, for example. But the problem in the past was you could always increase the number of placement groups but you could never decrease the number of placement crews. So in case your number were too high and you would like to decrease your number, the only way out of it was to create a whole new pool and to migrate your data. And this, or do, this whole black magic now more or less um, disappeared because now we ha can reduce the PG num um, as well, which is really, really cool. And on top of that, there's a way to do this automatically. So you can, can turn on uh, a manager module, which then at the end takes care of all of it, so you don't have to worry about it. Um, to be honest, that sums in the whole PG calculation um, and also that people had to worry about. I think that's something that should have never been exposed to the end user, so I think that's the right way of handling it, and it will improve even further in the future. So that's really, really cool. What else do we have? Um, we're now collecting smart data um, of our undulating um, OSTs, so this at the end, and reporting them back to the, ma to the managers, and um, can take a look at, at the um, output there. Um, on top of that, there is a module which was mainly driven and developed by Profit Store, um, and it does some calculation and failure prediction on top of that. So if you enable that module, it will scrape your smart data, and then it looks for some specific uh, errors and error count and whatnot, and then it will predict, okay, your disk is going to fail, let's say, in five weeks from now, roughly, or in two months, or let's say in five days, and you should replace it soon. Um, there is a, there is a built-in mode, but on top of that, of course, because it was developed by a third-party uh, vendor, there's also the cloud mode, that they're hosting in their environment, and then you're, I don't know, sending the data to their nodes. And um, they told us, I never tried it myself, that this has a higher accuracy and is absolutely, I think, the best thing you can get out of it. Um, one version is free, the other one is paid. Um, but as I said, you could also make just use of the local one. Um, how does this handle at the end? You can just raise some alerts, for example, that something is going to fail, or you can also um, turn it on that this OSD will automatically mark as out before the disk even crashes. Um, CLI command looks like that, for example. If you do Ceph device LS, then you get an output like that. And there, for example, you get, as I told, five weeks from now, five, eight days. So this one should be replaced rather soon. And same here. So you get some, some prediction, which is really nice. Crash reports. Um, in the past, uh, if a service in, in Ceph failed, um, you didn't even notice, to be honest. It was automatically more or less restarted, and then the, the logs were stored somewhere on this node, and you just had no clue that something happened when it came back on a Monday morning. Um, what it does now, all the log files are stored under slash varlib Ceph crash. Uh, directory pass, and then those are also synced to the mons uh, slash manager here, and there you could do something like a Ceph crash info, and there you get all the details on what happened. That's more or less a request to all of you. There is a module which is called telemetry module. Uh, what it does, it just takes those crash reports and uploads them to the community. But uh, you don't have to be worried. It's just about some basic information, the uh, current install Ceph version, um, how your structure looks like, so no critical and confidential data. The idea behind is that um, 
we get more predictable and better crash reports so we can, I don't know, fix things that are out there that we are not aware of. So that's just a warm request. If you have anything like a development cluster or something else ongoing, would be cool to get some reports. Um, if not, even better than nothing crash. But to be honest, I think there is something going to fail. That's enough for management. Um, let's switch to Rados. Um, again, more or less, because I already talked about the biggest feature, but the, that's the one I, the PG, PG num uh, reducing feature. Um, but I think that was also meant to be a management feature. From a pure Rados perspective, uh, it's the newest thing is the Messenger V2. Um, what is it? Sounds interesting. Um, what, between the Ceph demons, there is a, pro there is a um, protocol used, how they communicate, which is other. And the problem was that protocol wasn't encrypted at all. And it wasn't even possible to encrypt it. And the main driver for the Messenger V2 was that everyone asked about, OK, I would like to encrypt that communication between my demons on the various nodes, maybe hundred of them. So isn't there a way to do that? Yeah, now with Nautilus, there is a way to do that. And it's called Messenger V2. Um, the cool thing is, uh, the idea behind this is that we also support dual stack like IPv4 and IPv6. That six, that's not fully complete yet. So right now you can either choose between four or six, but um, it's in the last stretch. We also moved the monitor uh, port to uh, 3300, so the IANA port that we got already a while ago. And you don't have to worry, um, we have a dual support for the old web messenger and the new messenger version. So if you upgrade, for example, the new monitors, they will just listen on the other port as well. And if you have, have demons that could connect to the new one already, they will do. And if they won't, they will just connect to the old port and messenger v1. Some other radars improvements. Um, it's now, you can now set the OSD target memory, um, which, is, which is really cool, because in the past it was kind of compli uh, complicated um, to say how much memory will be used at the end by the OSD demons, so now you can limit it. Um, we also added NUMA support. You can now pin various OSD demons to specific NUMA nodes. Um, on top of that, we have now uh, improved the centralized config management, which does it mean, what does it mean? Um, in the past, you had to store the ceph.conf file on all the various nodes. And now um, those just need to be stored on the, on the monitors and can be managed from there. So that's also really cool because it's stored within an object. Um, progress bars was also something that was heavily requested because there are a lot of long running tasks in a Ceph cluster, at least that could happen. And the problem in the past was you just clicked on do it, or for example, in the dashboard, or you did a command um, in the, uh, in the, on the CLI, and then it just disappeared, and you had no clue what's going on. Um, with Ceph Progress, which also is reflected in the Ceph-S status, um, which is the Ceph status, um, you get now output of it, so you, have, so you know what's going on, at, at least for the most critical things. Minor fix, not sure if someone ran into that already. Um, misplaced is no longer a health warning. Someone asked me why is that a thing to name on stage. Um, to be honest, that's a thing because um, we had some customers who had the problem that they were on duty over the weekend, 24 by 7, and in, uh, if on a Sunday morning or Saturday evening, um, the cluster switched to a health warning just because of a mis uh, misplacing. Um, they told us all the time, really seriously, I, don't, I could fix that on Monday as well, but now my boss called me to fix it right now. Um, that's the reason we can now turn it off. Um, if you still like it, there's a flag, you can enable it again. Bluestore improvements, to so switch to the next one. Um, Bluestore has a new bitmap, bitmap allocator, um, which also more or less falls in the same direction like what the improvements on the OSD side were. Um, you can now have a more predictable memory utilization. I think that's what everyone is requesting. Um, and less fragmentation, which is the result out of it. Um, we now have a, or could make use of an intelligent caching. So um, the memory allocation between different caches like the RocksDB cache and all nodes in the data um, can be adjusted automatically, 
which is rather cool. We get a per pool utilization metrics, um, which is rather helpful. And also, this bubbles up again to this FDF command and some yeah, minor improvements. With, I think, Luminous, yeah, there it is, with Luminous, um, there was a new device class um, map introduced, however you want to call it. Um, and the problem was, before Nautilus, if you would like to switch to, let's say, this SSD HDD class, um, you always had to change the crush map, and then data was shuffled around. And people totally got annoyed by that, because why do I want to switch if I then have to shift, let's say, a few terabytes of data, um, because it's not necessary. Um, we fixed that, more or less, so we can now comp just switch to the new model without the need to shovel any data. Um, you can now set a hard limit on the PG log length, um, which also is really cool, because in some specific situation, this just led to yeah, uncontrolled memory utilization. So there was a bug, and it's now more or less fixed by that. And there is a new erasure, coded, uh, erasure code uh, way, which is called erasure code, uh, clay erasure. And uh, they promised um, a better recovery efficiency. Um, so the bandwidth between IO during a, uh, the, the, the usage between bandwidth and IO during recovery should be much better. Um, can't, can't tell because I, I haven't tested, but that's what they, they at least promised. RTW, um, what do we have there? Uh, in RTW, we can now create different so zones um, where you could, for example, notify and listen on. Um, this sets up an event stream you could subscribe to, for example, which you could use for, let's say, also things like... Um, um, well, a function as a service, for example, a specific object was placed, changed, whatever, then something else could be triggered, so you can listen to it. Um, we now have an archive zone, um, which uh, can be used. So your, f your whole data will be cloned, and there's a copy of your clone, but with versionizing on top, so every change of your object will be tracked there in a versionized way, which is really nice. And on top of that, we have the uh, possibility to create Tier, different tiers. So as I said, let's say you have an HDD spinner, uh, SSD, NVMe, and on top of that an archival zone. Your objects could move depending on your rules through all of those tiers. So that's another step forward. Um, and the Beast front end, or the, the RTW front end changed again. First of all, it was Apache, then it was Zipitbab, and now it was replaced by Beast. Um, again, as I said, of course, better performance efficiency in everything. What else? Why should we change? Um, so, yeah, let's see. RBD, I think that's really interesting. The next feature for everyone uh, uses a Ceph cluster underneath his, uh, or their virtual machine environment. Um, we now support RBD live migration, which is really cool. Um, so you can migrate an RBD from one pool to another. Um, in the past, that wasn't possible. If you create a pool, an RBD in a specific pool, you are bound to it. And now you can just live migrate between different pools, even between replicator, uh, replicated and erasure coded pools. I think that's a big step forward. Another improvement is the RBD top command. If you ever use any top command, you're, you know what I'm talking about, how this is supposed to look like. Um, there you get some, some output and statistics um, about your RBD device, obviously. Um, the command on the CLI, as you could guess, is of course called RBD perf image, uh, perf image IOTOP, which makes total sense to me, because why shouldn't I call it RBD top if I could put perf image IOTOP yeah, nevertheless, um, hopefully that will change. So uh, if you would like to give it a try, because we had some requests already, I think a couple of while ago in the IC channel that I remember, where someone asked, didn't you add the RBD top command? We said, yes, it's there. I tried it, but my shell always tells me unknown command. That's not part. Where is it? And then we told him, yeah, obviously it's called RBD perf image IO top. That doesn't it make sense to you? No. Um, as you can see here, what you would expect, some of the read and write IOPS, read and write bytes, same with latency. So, um, 
yeah, this improves also um, the statistics of RBDs and was something that was yeah, requested by day one, more or less. RBD MISC. Um, as I talked already briefly about the RBD mirror functionality that was added to the dashboard. Um, the main reason this is now easily possible was due to some changes that were made in Nautilus and also the um, configuration changes on a central, central place that makes it really easy compared to older versions um, post Nautilus. We now support uh, namespaces, so you can create uh, security domains within pools and lock specific clients into it, which is really nifty. Um, we also support pool level overrides. In the past, for example, you were capable of setting, um, activating the caching on an RBD device, for example, and now you can also do this on the pool level. And the RBD LS command sounds like just a minor thing, but now also lists the creation access and modification timestamp, um, which is again really helpful for administrators. Enough of that, let's go to CephFS. What do we have there? Um, yay, multi, -Ceph, multi FS uh, volume support is stable now. What does it mean? You can now have multiple CephFS uh, file systems within your Ceph cluster. Each of them have their independent set of rate of pools um, and MDSs. So that's something you have to be aware of, but at least it's uh, possible and it's called stable now with, with Nautilus. Um, we have a sub-volume concept, um, which was mainly copied from the Manila OpenStack driver into now the Ceph manager. So we can now create sub-volumes with their own quota, own CephX user, uh, keys, restrictions, and all of that. So that's also really cool. Um, and again, the unified uh, CLI. So you now have CephFS volume, CephFS sub-volume to fiddle around with those things, which is really handy. On top of that, if you would like to use NFS, obviously we're using NFS Ganesha and we're now supporting um, active-active deployment. Um, please don't get confused by active-active or active-passive. That doesn't mean that you can only have one active and one passive or one active and one active. In this case, this only means, okay, multiple active or just one active and multiple passive ones. So that's not bound to just two nodes. So in case you're wondering about that, because I had this question already. Um, we are now handling, thanks to more or less Jeff, a lot of changes that he made. And there's a really good talk from the DEF CON and, and uh, Jack. Um, check it out, a really good talk where he talks about that briefly and in detail. So if you're interested in those changes, um, I can just recommend the talk from, from Jeff Layton. Um, the NFS Ganesha daemons are fully managed via the new orchestrator interface. So, first of all, orchestrator interface at the end talks to the NFS Ganesha daemons. This is already fully integrated into Rook, for example, um, and others are to follow. Let's see who then is next. And the sub-volume and volume concept I've show, I, I showed you just a minute ago is also reflected here, so you can use it on top um, of the FFS and of, on your gateways um, as well. CephFS shell, um, there was something, if I remember correctly, was brought to us by a student that participated in the outreach project. And this was mainly used, or the, the idea behind was for scripting uh, purposes of CephFS. So let's say the problem was, for example, if you wanted to change the quota attributes, um, then you had, first of all, to mount the CephFS file system, and then you could change the attributes, and then you have to unmount it. Um, all of that is now possible within the CephFS shell. Um, it does the whole magic in the background for you. Nothing you have to worry about. So this is, this is really cool. And on top of that, yeah, some performance improvement to the MS, uh, MDSs, so something you would expect from, uh, from a new, new release. Cool. Let's get to the next topic, which is container. I just assume um, everyone talked about container already briefly over the weekend, because everyone is talking about containers, so we're going to talk about container as well, obviously. Um, 
If we take a look at containers, then we have two different views on it, more or less. First of all, we could say, okay, underneath containers, you need to store them somewhere. We need some storage, so Ceph could be used underneath your, let's say, Kubernetes deployment, and we'll put Ceph underneath. That's one way. The other way is, hey, we could maybe use, uh, move our services into containers for scale-out reasons and, and other reasons, and that's exactly what we are trying to achieve right now. Um, the whole idea, I think, is totally clear. Nothing I have to, to tell you um, over and over again. It's just um, to simplify uh, the OS dependency and more or less the scale-out um, perspective, scale-out and upgrade. Um, that's the main, main driver here. I think you heard about it already. Um, Rook, maybe. That's at least the operator that we are using from Ceph side of life. Um, it's really extremely easy to get it up and running. Even I was capable of setting up a, a container environment with Rook. Um, so you should be capable of, to do it as well, obviously. Um, it can already remove uh, adding and remove, uh, it could already add and remove mo monitors. It could deploy some demons on top. All of that went already into the Rook development. And I think it was three weeks ago, and I just checked briefly, and I saw that already a bug fix release went out as well, so I think we're already at 1.0.1 in the meanwhile, but the first official release was uh, three weeks ago, so it's now also declared and named stable, um, but still, obviously, there's, there's more to come and, and bugs fixes because now um, more and more end users make use of it. On top of that, um, we have already talked about right now more or less four deployment mechanisms. We have Rook, we have DeepSea, which is driven by, by SUSE itself, um, which uses Salt underneath, then we have Ceph Ansible, and on top of that, now we have what they call it the SSH orchestrator. Um, the SSH orchestrator is planned to be the replacement for Ceph Deploy, because Ceph Deploy was deprecated, and I know that a lot of people are out there who really loved Ceph Deploy because it was some, just a bash script and you could just script yourself because everyone is capable of writing a bash script. And uh, the need to learn a deployment tool, man, not everyone is keen on it. So that's why they came up with the SSH orchestrator now. So um, you don't have to worry. There is something new you can use um, and it's, yeah. Rather easy. The whole, the whole idea here is, again, to also integrate that again into Rook and then at the end into the dashboard again to have everything um, yeah, in one place. The, the thing that we're struggling with right now and uh, what we're trying to find out is the um, initial bootstrapping because we need at least a single mon and a single manager up and running to be able to start the dashboard on top and from there to deploy all the other services. Um, so it's more like a chicken and egg problem, so we're trying to find out what's the best way to bootstrap this, maybe to ship some pre-configured containers, um, just a single one way the, thing, the first monitor would spawn, for example. That's something that's work in progress and ongoing. Community-wise, um, for those of you who missed it, Ceph Foundation is now a thing. What is the Ceph Foundation? Um, the Ceph Foundation is a direct fund under the Linux Foundation, and the whole idea of that and the driver of this was, okay, we have, or in the, we, we still have two big vendors who are pushing Ceph apart from all the other com community members, which is obviously Red Hat and SUSE, and um, the problem one was I tried it myself a couple of years ago, um, to get some funding for a community event, which was driven by Red Hat, and I failed internally because we're not willing to send some money to the Reddish folks, and on the other hand, they had the same problems. They can't send any money, money to us. I think it's just forbidden on their bank accounts. I don't know. Um, but the solution to all of that is the Ceph Foundation, which is independent now, and um, they had 30 fun 31 founding member organizations, and in the meanwhile, three more members have joined, and there you give your money and they will make the best use of it for community events, for right now they, they think about um, hiring, for example, someone dedicated for documentation because everyone is complaining about the Ceph documentation is so horrible. 
yeah, it's documented in code. Um, I don't get it. But yeah, nevertheless, they're trying to find someone the same. The idea is to, to split the community role. They have a community manager, which is right now based in the US. So it's, the problem is our community events, as you can see here. Next slide are spread more or less around the globe. So it would be easier to have a dedicated role maybe in every region as well. And in case you would like to join one of those, next upcoming one is in, uh, is in the Netherlands. Um, after that, there is the one at, yeah, obviously CERN. And the cool thing about it, about it is that CERN uh, right now has a maintenance window. And the Sunday before, so if you arrive already, let's say Sunday morning or Saturday, um, there is the possibility to, yeah, go down, take a look at the LHC and everything. Um, so that's really cool. So I expect a lot of people to join that day just because of CERN and not because of Ceph. Um, so let's see. That's interesting. Um, and then after that, we have the Ceph day in London and the Ceph day uh, in Poland. Um, if you're interested to, to host one, feel free. Um, that's those are completely driven by the community. You can just reach out and say, yeah, we would like to host a Ceph day somewhere, let's say in, uh, somewhere in Europe, in the US, you don't, I don't care. Um, just send an email and we try to help wherever we can. And with that, here are just some links again where you find my presentation. It's the same I showed you already at the beginning. So uh, in case you would like to read some facts later on, um, and if not, um, I will come to an end and would like to ask you for questions, if you have any. Or if you're just hungry and you would like to have lunch now, I can definitely understand that as well. No questions, which could be a good thing, I, at least I, I, I hope so. And if you have any, just um, grab me in the hallway. And yeah, thanks everyone for joining and enjoy the rest of your day. <laughs>